good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Facebook uh, live session here in Nogales, Arizona, the Mariposa Community Health Center. Um, welcome to all of you. My name is Saladio Pereira. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Mariposa, and with me is uh, our esteemed colleague, uh, Fernando Silvas, from the Santa Cruz County Health Department and Epidemiology. Welcome, Fernando. Thank you, Dr. Pereira. And for a long time, we've had a really good relationship with the health department. We collaborate often. Uh, COVID-19 brought us really close together. We had a very successful campaign of uh, evaluation, testing, and vaccination. And for that, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to, to you and your staff. Um, our, our intent today is to review respiratory infections it is winter time. We're seeing quite a few respiratory infections. Uh, we see that a lot at our health center. Um, and we thought it would be important to review not just the illnesses that we're seeing, but also what are the precautions that you want to take to reduce the risk. Um, we cannot eliminate risk, but we can reduce risk by a, a number of interventions. and. Uh, with Fernando today, we'll review uh, mostly three. We're going to review influenza, COVID-19, and um, RSV, or respiratory syncytial virus. And if we have time, we'll touch a little bit about on whooping cough and, and pneumonia. We've seen a few cases of, of whooping cough. Um, so that, that's the idea today. Um, before I do that, I want to remind uh, our viewers and listeners that uh, this information is for guidance only and that uh, they should consult their primary care provider uh, if they suspect a respiratory infection. From our point of view, we use uh, trusted sources that are reliable, uh, in this case, uh, the Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, and CDC. So it's important that the information we provide to you come from uh, reliable uh, sources. The first illness is influenza. It's influenza has been around for a long, long time. It is a seasonal infection. It is a virus uh, caused by um, various strains, uh, A, B, and C. And um, this is the season of influenza. And we've seen uh, increasing cases as expected. And before I review the, the symptoms and the signs, Fernanda, what can you tell us what you've seen at the state level, uh, local level, even national level? What's happening with influenza in terms of numbers and epidemiology? Well, uh, influenza are at, at a high. Influenza rates are high in the state or uh, in comparison with the rates in the last five years. But that's to be expected because um, with COVID-19, people were isolated, people were wearing masks. There was so many strict precautions in place that influenza rates tanked during, the, during that pandemic period. So because of that, now our immune systems, our, our cultures, our personalities are all coming out right now and exposed. So of course, uh, influenza is on the rise. And, um, it did uh, spike, and but right now we're seeing a, a small decrease, but it'll come like a roller coaster in waves. And a reminder: this is a an infection that it can it can be transmitted by the respiratory route. Uh, we remind uh, our staff and our patient that it is in our breath. We cough it, we sneeze it, and so taking the proper precautions is important. We're going to talk about precautions in just a moment, but a reminder that influenza is a very distinct syndrome. Influenza uh, is not, generally speaking, a minor cold. It's typically a very, very discrete syndrome that is characterized typically by abrupt onset. Most people know exactly when they got sick. They could have been having dinner, then suddenly they have a chill they have a high fever, they have a sore throat, they have a profound muscle pain and cough. That's classic influenza. Uh, it also leads to extreme fatigue. 
many patients are not able to work. On physical exam, usually it's a high fever. When we examine the throat, we don't see much, maybe just slight redness of the throat. Typically, there's no pus uh, in the throat. We don't feel lymph nodes. And when you examine the lungs, the lungs are almost always normal. Uh, influenza can progress to influenza pneumonia. Not very common, but it can. Uh, or it can lead to a secondary bacterial infection later on. So the syndrome is very abrupt, very distinct. We have a test that we can do to diagnose influenza. And if we detect it fairly early, there is treatment. We, we usually use oseltamivir or Tamiflu. The, the treatment guidelines that um, we follow uh, usually is the Infectious Disease Society of America, or IDSA. The criteria for treatment is more liberal now. We now treat individuals who are at risk of influenza. That 48-hour period is not as strict anymore. I think those people who have diabetes, kidney disease, heart disease, we, we're treating. Uh, so, and of course, those people who have been in the hospital. So if we diagnose it, we can treat it, oseltamivir is effective. But, but before we get there, we want to prevent it. And so there are a couple of things that I'm going to ask Fernando to review. Fernando, what are the things available to reduce the risk of influenza? We have the vaccine, of course, and we have things that we can do similar to COVID. What sure. are those? Uh, so, of course, like you said, the vaccine is the first line of prevention. Uh, what else can we do in our homes, at our work, in our normal day-to-day -day life? Well, that would be uh, good hand washing. Don't forget your hands. Uh, the influenza virus can sit on surfaces for quite a while and remain infectious. Uh, cover your cough, cover your sneezes to prevent others from getting infected. Uh, when you touch uh, unclean surfaces and you haven't had a chance to wash your hands, make sure you don't touch your face, uh, your eyes, uh, other mucosal areas. Uh, that'll prevent some transmission and clean surfaces around your house. Uh, people want to be very kind of complex with their cleaning supplies, but bleach water, very highly effective. You live in there a little bit long enough and it'll take care of most of the issues, but definitely the friction of cleaning helps a lot too. Um, finally, um, simply getting tested will help reduce the spread uh, to your family, to your friends. So if you're experiencing symptoms that might be influenza or could be one of the others, as I'm sure we'll talk about how the symptoms uh, are similar to one another, uh, go get tested. Right, right. And, and testing a diagnosis hopefully will reduce the spread because once you're diagnosed, then you take precautions, you're treated. And a quick, a quick reminder that, you know, these respiratory infections are not a disease of one. It's actually a disease of, of families. And, and when you have families who may have people older than 65, people with chronic uh, diseases, um, individuals who may have cancer and they're being treated for cancer, those individuals can get really sick. And as such, it's our responsibility as community members um, to to take precautions to prevent the disease to others. We may be able to tolerate the illness, but a friend, a colleague, a family member may not, and that individual may end up in the hospital. The vaccine is available. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the vaccine in detail. Suffice to say that it's available for anyone six months of age and older. Uh, we offer all the influenza vaccines at our clinic and we have appointments available. So we do recommend that you can get you, that you get your uh, so-called flu shot. It is influenza, that's the right term, um, to, pre to reduce the risk of infection. So that's influenza. Then it's COVID-19. It's still there. Right. Uh, it's still here. Uh, symptoms can be very similar to influenza. Uh, I think the symptoms have vary over time because of different strains. Early on, cough and fever was very predominant. Then, because of mutations, it became mostly runny nose and sore throat. But suffice to say, it's a respiratory illness, cough, sore throat, fever, 
malaise, very difficult to tell. In our experience, influenza tends to be more abrupt. Uh, COVID tends to be a little uh, more uh, slow uh, in, in onset, but we test for both because sometimes it's, it's really difficult. Um, we do have the COVID vaccine available. Uh, we do recommend the new monovalent vaccine at the moment. And if symptoms are um, in onset less than five days, typically we can use a medication Paxlovid, which is available to reduce the risk. Fernando, in terms of COVID, how do you see the epidemiology in our county? And then can you review one more time, it doesn't hurt to repeat, the precautions that you take and that you recommend to reduce the risk? So COVID-19 in the county is, is obviously, like you said, still here. We're not seeing nearly the numbers we saw a year ago, two years ago, but uh, it's still a steady presence in the, in the community. And if we, where you have one COVID case, you have at least two or three more. Yeah. We're, they're just going unreported, especially with the availability of over-the-counter testing that we just don't hear about. Um, so what we're seeing is, uh, I brought a little bit of information with me. Um, so we're seeing maybe since October 1st, hi Dr. Williams. Since October 1st, we've seen maybe about, um, about 350 cases or so in the county. That's okay. reported cases. Um, and they're e very evenly distributed amongst uh, the various age demographics. Uh, 0 to 19, 20 to 44, 45 to 64, and 65 plus, okay. but 65 plus being uh, slightly higher in percentage uh, than the rest, but not too far off from each other. Um, so still a presence and still highly contagious, especially with some of the newer variants that are out there. Um, a nationally dominant variant right now is JN1, but here in the county, we're actually not seeing JN1 as much. Okay. We're seeing the XBB strains still. Okay. Uh, so that's, those are the variants we have now, but they are, uh, they are able to transmit uh, a little bit easier, um, but similar symptoms as the other Omicron variants. Um, so what do we prevent? Well, vaccination is gonna help you from getting uh, more severe disease. So you definitely wanna get that. But the uh, precautions in place are very similar to flu. Take droplet precautions, clean your surfaces, stay home if you're sick, cover your mouth and nose when you sneeze, uh, get tested, get tested, get tested, get tested. Talk to your physician, your clinician, and find out what you have so you can take the proper precautions to protect others and yourself. Uh, like you mentioned, the antivirals, um, if you do have it, you can talk to your physician about that, but also isolation periods are important. Um, even if you've been vaccinated, if you're positive for COVID-19, we want you to isolate to protect your household and the community. Uh, there's still a, a, f a minimum five-day isolation period. And then, you know, if, you, if you're feeling better and talking to your clinician, everything's okay, you go out with a mask for a little while longer. Uh, that's, the min that's the least we can do, so that's what we're looking for. Yeah, and going back, you know, these respiratory infections, it's a disease of all. Right. If we get it, we can transmit it to others. And in my opinion, we all have a duty to protect each other. And that's really important. Welcome, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Glad, no, glad, no, glad, you glad to you join our, you. our broadcast today. So we spoke about influenza, spoke about COVID, and we're going to talk about RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. It's out there. A disease of children for a long time, and now it's a, it can be a disease of adults. But you're a pediatrician. So tell us about RSV in children how it presents, how parents may be able to suspect RSV, and when do they need to bring the child to see you and the pediatricians? Perfect timing. We're actually kind of in the heart of RSV season, so happy to talk about it. So RSV is a big deal in pediatrics. I'm sure you know, you know that, Fernando. Um, it's actually the number one cause of hospitalizations in kids less than a year old. So. Okay. You know, especially in the winter months, typically from um, late October to really the end of April, May, um, it, it's definitely a, a, a very big deal. So what is it? It's caused by a virus, just like you said, a respiratory syncytial virus. And really it causes a couple things. Um, first thing it causes is lots of mucus production. So you'll see kids, they have kind of a typical RSV picture. They come in, they're very, very snotty. 
Um, all of that mucus can also cause mucus plugs in the lungs, and that can lead to respiratory distress. So that can lead to kids, kids having what's called tachypnea, where they're breathing fast. And little babies, they can have retractions. It's where you kind of suck in right beneath your ribs. They can have nasal flaring. So they can have all the classic pediatric signs of respiratory distress. So how we diagnose it is very similar to the flu or COVID. We now have a, have a test we can do. So we actually have rapid tests or PCRs. And um, if you're positive, what we do basically varies per age. The rule for RSV is that the younger you are, the more likely uh, that you could have problems leading to hospitalization. The reason is that in little babies, especially babies under six months, their lungs are so, long, uh, so small, their airways are so small that they, get, they can get severe bronchiolitis or they get mucus plugging and it can cause, it can cause respiratory to distress and issues. So um, what do we do? So if you have any of those worrisome signs that I mentioned, have to come see your pediatrician right away or go to the ER or, or to the urgent care. Um, all of our pediatricians, of course, are, are very familiar with, with, with how, to, how to diagnose and treat. And you know, essentially, we'll, we'll do a test, see if it is RSV. And the treatment has actually changed. So many years ago, uh, when I first started practicing, we would treat it very similar to asthma. So we'd give albuterol, we would give steroids. You know, the recent studies in the last five to six years have shown that really that doesn't, not, doesn't really help. So really, it's supportive care meaning that we you know, give oxygen to kids that have um, low oxygen, we suction, and we basically wait for them to get better. I tell parents that it's a five to seven day window before they get better. It's gonna take at least five days, for the, especially if they're hospitalized, for, for your, the, the, the kids to get better. And the same in adults, it's usually... An illness four to seven days in adults is fever, cough, uh, and profound fatigue. And in adults, it's, it's a fatigue, fatigue issue, but they can get a fever, and they can get really sick too. In adults, we have a new vaccine available uh, for 60 and older, uh, particularly those with immunocompromised, so we want to promote that. Tell us about children. That's a different... Okay, very exciting news in pediatrics. It's, we actually don't have a vaccine. Well, we, there's, it's called a monoclonal antibody. So right. I don't, go, I don't want to go through all the immunology of it, but it basically is very yeah. similar to a vaccine. And what it does is that it um, dramatically reduces the risk of hospitalization. Some studies say as much as 90% reduction in hospitalization in mm. kids that, that, that get the, the monoclonal antibody. Very effective. Very effective. And it's given uh, before kids turn eight months for most kids. Okay. So really, you know, we, um, you can get it, you know, right after birth or, you know, within that first week of life. Um, and again, it's hi highly effective. There are some kids um, greater than eight months. So if you're eight months to 18 months and you fit certain criteria, then you may also qualify. Dr. Williams. And then we're going to come back to uh, prevention in just a moment, but I want to uh, kind of switch quickly to two more respiratory infections that we've seen, and that's pertussis, a whooping cough. Um, uh, there's a vaccine available called Tdap. We do in adults about once every 10 years. It offers good protection. Uh, just remember, whooping cough is cough, cough, cough. A prolonged, severe cough. That's a classic person. And we've seen a few cases where patients have had cough for, for a long time, and we're able to diagnose it, uh, treat it, and sometimes we have to treat um, household members with antibiotic therapy, even if you had the, the vaccination. So a quick alert about whooping cough. Um, and the other one's pneumonia. It's a bacterial pneumonia. We have a vaccine available. We have various vaccines, but the one that typically have now is called PCV20 and PPSV323. Uh, that's a question for the doctor, which one to get. There's a new app that can help us decide based on your age and your chronic diseases which vaccine you, you should get. So, so we have those, those vaccines available for, for protection. So... Uh, sorry, Dr. Perry. There's a couple of questions for me. Yes, there's a question. Yes, of course. So it's uh, Blanca Bustamante. Blanca Bustamante saying, how much are the tests for the flu? So uh, I, I, the, I don't have the, the cost for the, for the flu test. We can get that and, and send it to you via broadcast. I don't want to give the wrong uh, information, but we, we, can, we can check on that. Okay, and then it's uh, Irma Aguirre uh, saying, ¿Recomienda algún alimento para prevenir las infecciones respiratorias? 
Muy buena pregunta. So, en general, uh, y, y, y estuvimos comentando eso hace un poquito, en general, you know, la nutrición buena, vegetales, frutas, es buena para la salud, eh, manteniendo uh, un cuerpo saludable a través de buena nutrición, buen peso, reduce la, la posibilidad de infección y otras enfermedades. No necesariamente reduce el riesgo de una enfermedad específica. Si nos, nos ayuda a mantener saludable y somos menos, somos menos propensos a, la, a las infecciones respiratorias. Pero, pero muy buena pregunta, muy buena pregunta. Y la, y la última pregunta que nos ha llegado, doctor, dice, ¿are COVID test free? Sí, sí. Y, y la vacuna hasta diciembre 31 del 24. Es lo que, es lo que, correcto. Um, so, vamos a cambiar español un poquito. Uh, vamos a hablar de las intervenciones que podemos hacer para reducir el riesgo de uh, infecciones respiratorias. Hablamos de lavar las manos. Fernando. Sí, hablamos de, pues, comenzando pues, de lavarnos las manos, uh, de limpiar las, uh, sus áreas con desinfectante como cloro, uh, pues, man, manteniendo un lugar limpio desinfectado cuando alguien está enfermo en la casa, uh, también pues que reciben sus vacunas uh, para prevenir, uh, pa prevenir una enfermedad y también cuando están, se, se sienten mal, uh, tomen una prueba con su doctor, hablen con, con sus doctores y pues también um, se necesitan, si están enfermos, quédense en su casa uh, para que no uh, pasen la enfermedad y ¿Qué más se me fue? Podemos, podemos mencionar que evitar lugares congestionados. Oh, eh, sí. Y si necesitan, bien, usen una máscara. Tengan confianza con eso todavía. Una máscara para evitar adquirirlas y, 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 y transmitir la, la enfermedad a otros lugares. Un recordatorio, influenza es una enfermedad abrupta. Empieza de momento fiebre, dolor muscular, tos dolor de garganta, tenemos una prueba buena para hacer el diagnóstico y tenemos medicamento para tratar la influenza. Ahora el, el, la recomendación un poquito más liberal para tratar, sobre, es importante hacer el diagnóstico no solamente para proteger a la persona que tiene síntomas, sino para proteger a nuestro hogar. Lo mismo de COVID-19, hacer el diagnóstico, aislarnos y proteger, y proteger a otro. La idea de esto es eh, hablar de prevención, uh, reducir el riesgo de enfermedad más bien en las personas mayores, um, informar al público que tenemos tratamiento, que tenemos la vacuna disponible y que es responsabilidad de todos nosotros proteger el hogar, proteger los amigos, proteger los colegas y proteger a las personas mayores eh, cuando tenemos la habilidad de tomar los pasos necesarios para reducir eh, no solamente la infección, sino reducir la posibilidad de transmitir esa infección a otros. Últimos comentarios, doctor, acerca de pediatría. Uh, consejo a los papás. ¿Qué síntomas eh, deben estar presentes para que el papá o la mamá traiga al niño al pediatra? I'm sorry, what, what symptoms? What are the symptoms that parents need to look for yeah. to bring to the pediatrician? Yeah, so um, obviously fever, especially fever more for two or more days, or high fever. If kids have fever more than uh, 103 or above, we need to see th th those, those kids immediately. Another one is those signs of respiratory distress that I, that I, that I mentioned. I always tell parents, if your son or daughter looks different, um, you know, noticeably different, We take your word for it. We need to see them. We need to figure out why. So any real change from baseline. All right. And also another key one is decreased appetite. So especially in babies and kids less than a year old, if they're having you know dramatic decrease in um, in feeding, we need to see them. With respiratory illnesses, you know they get they get um, plugging of their of their nose. And babies, they're obligate nasal breathers. So if you put a bottle in their mouth, then their nose is stopped up. You know they're they're not going to feed. They 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 just start to cry. So that's another good, um, uh, good thing to look for, decrease feeding. We need to see them immediately. Excellent, excellent recommendation. And um, when they bring in, they can, uh, they can ask about RSV. 
And what else we can do to prevent this, right? Nowadays, we typically test for three things, RSV, flu, and COVID. So really, for any kid with fever, you know, cough, lots of nasal congestion, those three tests we're going to order. Excellent. Fernando, any final thoughts? Well, just like Dr. Williams mentioned, that's the triple threat that everyone's worried about. So as we mentioned earlier, take the time to test because this is important. Uh, that triple threat of RSV, COVID, and flu is what everyone's afraid of as far as ho potential hospitalizations. So get tested, isolate, and get a treatment you need. Speak to your physician. Great. Thank you very much to my colleagues for a great time. Um, I hope this was helpful to you. Our intent is to give you some ideas about what's happening in the county in terms of the three illnesses we worry about. I did mention a fourth and a fifth, pertussis and, and pneumonia, but these are very common illnesses, influenza, RSV, and COVID-19. I think we have the ability to reduce risk. It's really important for us to take the precautions to protect. With that, I think we're gonna end. This is Eladio Pereira, and the Chief Medical Officer Mariposa. Thank you very much for uh, your time. We thank you for your support during these transmissions and um, we'll see you the next time. Have a great weekend. Take care.